Um, so empathy for challenging children. And this was, uh, Russell Barkley had a teacher who said to him one time, and remember he deals mostly with ADHD kids, and his instructor said, the kids who need the most love will ask for it in the most unloving ways. Isn't that the truth? Right? So the kids who activate our empathy the least are often the ones who need it absolutely the most. Um, I'd like to take a moment, again, I promise no role plays, but I would like to take a moment to practice a strategy that has been suggested for increasing empathy. Um, and I want to explore what that is like. So I'd like you each to just pull out a piece of paper, any old thing. Um, and I would like you, once I explain what we're going to do, I would like you to think of a child in the past or currently that you deal with on, an on, uh, on, on a regular basis or have dealt with on a regular basis who has a behavioral health disorder of some sort, some behavioral health challenges or issues that you find it difficult, that you find yourself in conflict with or you find yourself frustrated with, okay? And we're going to practice this exercise. So this is called cognitive effective mapping. And it is a way of visually expressing conflict. And it's a way that facilitates our ability to take perspective um, and come to a resolution of the problem. So this is used um, both for interpersonal conflicts, but it's also used at like more of a global level for um, political conflicts at times and really complicated. And they've even come up with software, and I have it on my computer, but uh, it just real, seems really silly when you can just draw it out. But there are computer programs. One of them is called Empathetica. Empathetica? Empath Empathetica. Yeah, it's in the references. Um, and it allows you to do it uh, by means of a computer program where you um, designate these different um, conflicts and the computer then reads your side of the conflict and it reads the other person's side of the conflict and it suggests avenues for possible um, compromise. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So first, the first task is to identify, so what, you, what I'm going to have you do is actually, I'm going to have you do cognitive effective mapping for the other person, for the student in this case, not for yourself, okay? Because um, I think that's more of a stretch for most of us. I want you to identify the main concepts, beliefs, goals, and the emotions of the person that you're modeling. I want you to identify those elements as either emotionally positive or emotionally negative. And accordingly, I'll have you represent them by ovals or hexagons, and I'll show you what this looks like uh, and some examples. And then what you're going to do is you're going to identify the relations between the elements that are either complementary so that they facilitate one. So, um, so say, um, I'll, I'll show you an example. So if they're complementary and one leads naturally to another, it'll be a solid line. If they're in conflict and one prevents the other one from happening, you'll have a dashed line between it, okay? Um, and then we'll look at the resulting map, and if you feel comfortable, you can kind of share that and talk about it. Okay, so this is an example. Son and father are in conflict because uh, the father wants the son to do the dishes, and the son doesn't want to do the dishes, and so various outcomes can result. All right, so things that are positive are green, and they're ovals. Things that are negative are hexagons and they're red, but we don't have to worry about color right now. So the son does the dishes. This is whose perspective here? Dad. This is dad, right? So the positive, the positively valenced outcome is the son does the dishes, right? So if the son does the dishes, that outcome is incompatible with the father having to do the dishes. So you see it has a dashed line in between because those two are incompatible. If the son does the dishes, then the dad won't, okay? Um, if the son does the dishes, the dishes won't be in the sink. So those two are incompatible. The father views only one of these potential outcomes as a positive, which is the son doing the dishes. All other outcomes are negative. So if the son doesn't do them, the dishes are in the sink. The father's going to end up doing the dishes. And if the father ends up doing the dishes, the father's going to nag. And those are all negative outcomes. All right. Whose perspective is this then? <laughs> this is the son's. Okay, the son's positive outcome is father does the dishes. If the father does the dishes, then the father will nag. That is a complementary connection there. It will happen. But that's a negative outcome, right? So his positive leads to a negative outcome, which is the father nagging. If the father does the dishes, the dishes will not be in the sink. Those are mutually 
exclusive. Um, if the father does the dishes, the son will not do the dishes. Those are mutually compatible. So for the son, him having to do the dishes, his father nagging are both negative outcomes. Yellow rectangles are neutral. He doesn't care if they're in the sink. That's a neutral outcome to him. Does this make sense? Okay, see what you can do. Think of a student with potentially some conflict that you've had, um, and from their perspective, try to draw out a bit, of a, a bit of an example of a conflict using this perspective taking strategy. This isn't something we do very often, both the geometrics of it and also the exercise, so. You're, you're mapping, yes, a conflict. Yep. But, yep, you've identified the conflict. And then you're mapping their, their cognitive effective map. So the possible outcomes. So, and you're doing it from their perspective. So their desired outcome, their um, uh, avoided outcome, the connections among those, and you're trying to do it from their perspective. I tried like four times. <laughs> Okay, um, did anybody feel like they had some success at mapping out a simple little something something? <laughs> no. I see a lot of confusion. Raise your hand if you've got something that you'd be willing to, come on up. Come on. Oh, you want me to go up? Yeah, yeah. That's not good. And this is actually a microphone right here. So if you could just stand right under that, that'd be awesome. <laughs> okay, so what do you got? <laughs> So I have a student who likes to be out of class all the time, oh. whether it's in the nurse's office or my office or just not in class. Okay. So if she's not in class, she's getting what she wants. Right. But the bad result of that is she's not passing her classes and she's not learning her materials. I prefer that she be in class. Okay. That's perfect. Now, so the po positively valenced uh, thing for her would be I'm out of class yep. and that's my green. Yeah. That's my green oval. Okay. Um, but when she's out of class, she is not passing. Is that a negative outcome for her, or is that neutral? Um, it's a negative outcome. She, to, her. To, to her. Not just for her, but to her. It is to her. And it is to her mom, because then okay. she has a grounding consequences at home. So there's so. more. Okay, mm -hmm. so when she's out of class, um, she's not passing. That's a negative outcome. And then, what, and then she also has negative consequences at home. Yep. Okay, your preferred outcome is that she be in class. Okay, so where is the point of potential compromise? Were you able to identify from kind of perspective taking where the element, so for example, you, one of the reasons it's important to say, is it a neutral outcome or is it a negative outcome is motivation. So for an awful lot of kids, simply not passing um, is not a negative outcome. It's a neutral, if anything, right? Because that's not their currency. For her, it is. So then, where does that lead us to go in terms of our perspective taking? I 
my thing with her is you get five minutes and then I'm walking okay. you back to class. Okay. And that leads us into the, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, that leads us into then um, another issue because once, okay, and, and so this is in a very, very limited way, but do you see the potential function or, uh, or benefit of this sort of thing? Because this leads into then that talk about function of the behavior. Because I would say, ooh, I doubt if it's a negative outcome that she's flunking or she'd be staying in class. So then we start to say, okay, well, that is a negative outcome. I know that's an emotionally valence negative outcome for her. So why is she leaving class? What, what is it that's so important to leave class for that she's willing to tolerate that? What I know from looking at this now is a negative outcome for her. Hmm. Do you know the answer? Okay, so, so that leaves us then some more room for perspective taking and some empathy because it's got to be something pretty powerful if she's willing to forego, you know, passing the class and then take on those negative consequences as a result. So this is very, anybody else want to share something? <coughs> Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, so that's something I think it's, that's worth uh, exploring. And this will lead us into, okay, so that's the, that's the end basic. Um, questions about basic behavioral health stuff, um, ADHD, depression, anxiety, um, all of that kind of stuff.